Greetings, listeners, and welcome. I am your host, Beatles Fanize. Tonight, we hear a story from a cop when he was a rookie, when he and his partner were introduced to a case of a missing person and the series of supernatural events that occur during their investigation. So sit back, kick your feet up, Turn out the lights and listen to I was a police officer investigating a missing person and it was the worst case of my career. Part 1 by MC Horror Dark and Creepy This series of supernatural events I'm going to recollect to you has been kept extremely confidential and non-disclosed for a good 15 years. I was involved with this particular case back when I was a rookie, only being a police officer for about a year and a half. All areas and people I will refer to in this will have their names changed to protect their identity as well as my job. The first time I was introduced to this case was when my partner and I were called out to investigate a missing person. This person, who I'll refer to as John, was a camp host for one of the campgrounds in the local forest, which is part of our district. The person who reported him missing was a middle-aged woman who worked at the local lodge. We asked her a few basic questions, such as how long he had been missing, which were about two days, and how did she know he was missing? She told us that he would always come into the lodge for a pack of cigarettes each morning and had been doing that for the past two months. So when he didn't come in for two days in a row, she became suspicious. I then asked her how he acted and her response intrigued me at the time when she said John was the quiet type not saying much to anyone other than the occasional hello he never bought food or supplies here and I didn't find out why until one day I offered him a free gallon of milk that was about to expire and the next day he gave me a disturbed look as if I was trying to give him poison. I soon figured out that he didn't trust food that he didn't make or kill himself. He was extremely antisocial, and I wouldn't be surprised if he went off to live in the woods by himself. She answered a few more questions pertaining to the case, but nothing that I need to inform you about. Soon after we finished questioning her, we went back to check out the campground he was in charge of, which was only five miles from the lodge, but on a winding dirt road that went up the side of the mountain. When we first arrived at the campground that John was in charge of, we noticed that it had not been well kept and maintained. The fire pits were full of ashes and the bathrooms looked as if they hadn't been cleaned for months, with many different substances and graffiti coating their walls. After we surveyed the other campsites and introduced ourselves to the families who were camping there, we went to visit the man's trailer, which was isolated at the end of the loop. Surprisingly, his campsite was clean and had been taken great care of, It was when we entered the man's trailer that the smell hit us like a ton of bricks. It stunk so bad that I expected to find his corpse rotting away in there, but his body was nowhere to be found. When I tried to turn on the lights to see better, and they flashed on for a fragment of a second, but quickly went out, that's when I realized that the smell must have been coming from his fridge. Everything inside must have spoiled due to the power being out. I went over to open it, 
but I wish I had never had. Because when I did, a gust of wind that came from within it literally caused my eyeballs to burn. Being blinded for a moment, I bent over and rubbed them frantically. My partner came over wondering what was wrong when his eye caught what was in the fridge. Oh man, that's, that's disgusting. He muttered as I lifted my head to see what he was looking at with my bloodshot eyes. There in the fridge was the carcass of a squirrel, a few birds, and lastly, what looked like chopped up pieces of a deer that still had their fur attached to it. Everything, I mean everything, was rotting away, and the flies that lingered in the trailer swarmed the fridge, which my partner, who I'll refer to as Daniel, quickly shut. We briefly looked around to see if there was any evidence that could give us a clue of what happened to this man. Right before we were about to leave, I saw the edge of what looked like a book poking out from underneath the mattress. I grabbed it and walked out of the trailer to escape that dreadful smell that still had my eyes watering up. The book felt cold in my hand, even though the sun was blazing. Upon opening the book up, I felt the world around me seem to, it, it, it seemed to stop as the wind came to a halt. Even the birds stopped chirping. Do you feel that? Daniel asked me of, as I looked about. What? I replied, wondering if he felt the same silence I did. Can't really explain it, but I feel as if something's watching us, he said as his head twisted about. I don't know if it was my mind playing tricks on me, but then I felt the same eerie feeling. Yeah, and did you hear everything go silent? I asked, back wondering what was going on. Uh, um, let's report back to the chief and get the hell out of here, he said while walking back to the vehicle. When we heard a raspy whistling cutting through the silence, that caused us to quicken our pace, trying to leave the area as fast as we could. Glancing at the book in my hand, I wondered what to do with it. I was supposed to turn it in as evidence, but decided to hold on to it for just a bit before I turned it in. I was honestly curious to see what type of book this guy had because of how unusual he seemed to be. Looking back now, I wish I would have just turned it in as evidence because what I found inside was sickening to the very core. While my partner Daniel drove us back to town, I started to read the book, which I soon found out was actually the man's journal due to how everything was handwritten and some pages had illustrations. It was all unsettling and off the bat. I could tell that this man had some demons lurking inside of his head. I will go into more depth of what was written and drawn in that journal later. But as for now, I need to state that if the chief of police that's over my department ever found out that I stole this journal and then disclosed the details of this case online without prior consent, then I could risk losing my job. So I hope no one recognizes this because this case involved many people whose experiences and testimonies of what happened will be shown. Anyway, when we got back to the station, we had already reported everything we found out about the man over the radio and they were able to properly ID him. The strange thing is that they didn't have much on him since he's been out in the woods for so long. He had only one living relative left, and that was his mother. 
The only thing they were able to pull up under his name was that when he was 13, he had accidentally burned down his parents' house during the night due to unknown reasons. One account states that he said he was performing a, uh, some sort of satanic ritual. <sighs> this missing person was unlike any person I ever investigated since. Continuing with the main subject matter, this case involving the camp host has been by far the most mysterious and gruesome case that I've ever investigated. Everything that had happened up to the point of when I stole the journal was only the shallow part of this story. But little did I know that I would soon find myself in the deep end of the pool. What we found out there could cause any sane person to have a mental breakdown. So I'm not going to drop it on you all at once, but rather spoon feed it. This was only the beginning of this goddamn nightmare. What exactly has our protagonist and his partner stumbled upon? A missing person? Satanic rituals? To quote a line from our story, what we found out there could cause any sane person to have a mental breakdown. So, listeners, tune in next week for part two of I Was a police officer investigating a missing person, and it was the worst case of my career. <laughs>